what's up my channel it's your friendly neighborhood sassy blonde writer coming at you with a writing video today i know it's been a while since we did a video on this topic but i figured you know it's about time we uh, wrap it up today we are finally closing our discussion on remakes reboots retellings and adaptations we are closing it off with the discussion on adaptations what are they and uh how do you write them? We've been talking about them a lot, and uh, we've yet to finally discuss that final one. Why, you ask? Because I've been avoiding it, I'm gonna be honest. I've been avoiding it because there was a lot to talk about, and I honestly wasn't really sure the best way to everything about it. I've made a lot of videos talking about the separate different types of mediums that you can use for adaptations, but I haven't talked about adaptations so but you know I figured today it's time to jump on in so an adaptation is a movie television drama or stage play that has been adapted from a written work typically a novel it's different from a retelling because you are taking the same story but you're changing the medium that it is told through so that is what makes it unique. So for example, Pride and Prejudice was originally a novel by Jane Austen. That is the source material. We've talked about that before. Then they adapted it in 1955 for the BBC miniseries. And then they adapted it again because you can't get enough of this story in 2005 for the movie. So that is one example of an adaptation. Another example is the musical Wicked was an adaptation of the book, which is also named Wicked. A lot of times adaptations just have the same name. Another example is her interactive Nancy Drew, The Secret of the Old Clock, is a point and click video game adaptation of the book Nancy Drew and The Secret of the Old Clock. As you can see, there are a lot of different ways to do an adaptation, lots of different options, and all you have to do is basically pick a story and then pick a different medium that you're good at writing, whatever that is. And I have videos for all those different types of mediums that I will be linking to as we go through them. So I'm gonna kind of give a Netflix synopsis or Reader's Digest version of each of these, but I'm gonna kind of try to sum it up right here. Similar to a retelling, the adaptation gives the creator a chance to explore themes from the original source material and add parts that they feel were missing from the original. Um, typically, if you do an adaptation of something older, for example, I know there's a rule with Shakespeare, if you adapt something from Shakespeare, if you put on like a new production of Shakespeare, there's basically a rule that you can't change a word of Shakespeare. So a lot of times when they make movie adaptations, they get around that by just adding scenes that don't have any words. So that is something to keep in mind. A lot of times they don't necessarily add new scenes. Sometimes they do. It depends. When you make an adaptation of something, you have to consider the differences between the two mediums. So for simplicity's sake, we're going to stick to mainly books and certain medium here for this session because otherwise it's going to be a lot. First thing is first, books to movies and TV shows. Since movies and TV shows, there are a lot of similarities with regards to like the visual medium and whatnot. So one of the major reasons why movie adaptation of a book is never as good as the original is just time. And I go into this a little bit in my whole video discussion that's dedicated to this topic, but one of the major factors is just time. The average book, and this is probably a low estimate, but about like 500 pages. The average screenplay is like 200 pages. You do the math. So naturally there are going to be things that are cut when you're going from, you know, a book to a movie. And naturally things that are going to have to be cut. So this is one of the reasons why with the rise of a lot of streaming services that there are a lot more books and I've noticed a lot more comic books are getting adaptations into not movies specifically, but a lot of mini series and TV shows um, because the audience tends to just prefer the addition of other plots as opposed to cutting things for a movie. And generally when you adapt something for a TV show because a TV show is longer, you adapt a book for a TV show, they end up having to kind of stretch it out a little bit more. So they end up having to add things to the original plot 
of the book kind of stretch things out a little bit more so people are usually happier when you have to add things to the original plot rather than take away what could potentially be their favorite part that's why you're probably seeing a lot more books being adapted into tv shows rather than the other way around rather than books being adapted into movies in tv shows and miniseries you also have the opportunity just because you have the luxury of time that most movies don't have so you have the luxury of time to add scenes and establish stakes that you wouldn't really have in a movie. So you can just establish things that maybe weren't really clear in the source material that you wouldn't really get a chance to do in the movie because you got a lot of plot to get through, so you gotta wrap things up. An example of this is the Pride and Prejudice miniseries where they show Mr. Bennett just like agonizing over the ledger and the money, which shows that the family was in a rough financial state, which when you're reading Pride and Prejudice, may not be obvious because you're probably not familiar with language Regency England. And so why would you know that? You can also take your time and explore themes and the source material. And however, um, with TV shows, however, with TV shows that are based off of books, do run the risk the TV show outlasts the source material and you end up wrapping up the TV show. You end up wrapping up the story from the book. The TV show's still going on. That tends to be when things jump the shark or kind of go off the rails because you ran out of the source material so now you don't really have anything to base things off of so you kind of flounder. So that's something to keep in mind that movies don't really have that issue where movies, you know, they take longer to produce. Generally, movies have just the source material and keep pulling from that well if there are a lot of sequels. So something to keep in mind. Next type of adaptation is books to plays. Now I have seen some really good adaptations of books to plays, like Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird adaptation, which was um, a play adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, where he added some themes between Calpurnia and Atticus Finch. Um, Calpurnia was the maid and Atticus Finch is the lawyer. He is, I, I think he's just kind of taken on to be the uh, like pick the poster boy for white savior trope. And um, it was clear when you're watching the play that Aaron Sorkin knew this. And so he had a couple of scenes where Calpurnia and Atticus Finch have a dialogue. That whole thing is kind of addressed where it's really interesting. Calpurnia kind of calls Atticus out on this. It's really interesting because these additional scenes, they give Calpurnia more of a meteor role. And it, I remember reading the book and I, I always wanted that scene. And so it was really nice to see the play and then have that scene happen because it was kind of something when you read the book, it was an interaction between Atticus and Calpurnia that you always wanted to happen but never did in the book. And it was also kind of humanizing for Atticus Finch because when you read the original book, Atticus Finch is just kind of this all around like Mary Sue kind of character where he's just like, always does the right thing and he's just perfect all the time, blah, 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 blah. The additional scenes kind of helped give it more of a modern perspective and the direction was interesting. That's another thing that you have to keep in mind when you adapt something for a play is that if you're the creator or the playwright, you have to think about the additional scenes and how you can address modern criticism through that lens, especially keeping in mind like how old the play is. But you also have to keep in mind any direction that the director might take and how that might impact the audience with like the stage flow and how the audience is gonna be able to follow the story because one of the things with To Kill a Mockingbird is, I mean, the way it's, the story is told, it's kind of disjointed because it's basically a child's dream of consciousness, trying to piece together the story of this one summer. So it was a really good adaptation of, and I've also seen some really bad adaptations of books to play as 1984, where the playwright focused on the love story, which if you've read 1984, you know is the weakest part, but you know, that's, that's what this guy did. He tried to turn 1984 into this dystopian love story. And also the director was so focused on trying to shock and horrify the audience and overuse strobe lights. It got to the point where it was so overused in the first 10 minutes of the play that we were just desensitized to it for the rest of the show. That is something to keep in mind where it's all about what you try to focus on. So with anything, and I guess this also goes for movies as well because you will be working with a director, you have to think about what you as the writer presumably are focusing on as the writer. Are you focusing on the strongest parts of the story? Are you trying to build up the story? That's one of the problems with 1984. The love story is really forced. 
So no matter what the writer did, could have been the best writer in the world. Love Story for 1984 is still gonna feel really forced because it was just kind of thrown in for no reason. However, on the other side of things, the writer for To Kill a Mockingbird, the play adaptation, chose to focus on addressing modern criticism of the original source material, and that really enhanced the play. So that's something that you want to think about when you're adapting it. Books to musicals. In my video on storytelling and musicals, I obviously talk about it more in depth because it's dedicated to the topic. So I'll just kind of speed through it a little bit here. I'll just say that uh, music in a musical, when you're adding it to a story, music should always be used to enhance the dramatizing of the story. Or you, could, you should use it to entertain the audience while you tell them something. So it's all about show versus tell. When you're showing them something through dramatization, you want to use music to kind of enhance that. And when you're telling them something, you want to use music to kind of entertain the audience while you're telling them. Just something to keep in mind. Watch the video about it if you want to learn more. Books to video games. Now in my video on video game story writing, I obviously go more in depth with this because so I talk about the different options that there are for video games. Before you get started, obviously, think about your story in an interactive sense. If you were going to make this story interactive, how would your player interact with the world? And from there, you can determine what type of game and the primary player loop would be from there. So for example, let's go back to the example from the beginning. Nancy Drew, the good old Nancy Drew games. You can probably see it on my shelf. I do love the Nancy Drew games. I play other games, but I do enjoy the Nancy Drew games. Like, and I have a special place in my heart because that's like how I started playing video games. The Nancy Drew games, with a lot of mysteries, they tend to be point and clicks because, I mean, you point and click and interact with the clues that way. So if you're trying to unfold a mystery, obviously somebody has to walk around. That would be the primary player loop. They have to walk around, interact with hidden, with different objects, play with different puzzles. If you're making a mystery, that is something to keep in mind. When you want to adapt a book to a video game, it is very important to establish what type of video game it will be and what the primary player loop will be from there. I think you should figure out the type of video game first because that will help you figure out the primary player loop from there. Is it going to be action adventure game? Is it going to be a platformer game? Because the overall look and feel of a platformer like Mario is completely different from how the game Assassin's Creed or The Witcher looks and that's totally fine but they're completely different ways to tell a video game story so if you figure that out first and the overall aesthetic of it then the rest of it will come. That's all I've got for you today folks. I hope you enjoyed this little wrap up on this topic of reboots, remakes, retellings, and adaptations. If you want to learn more about those different topics I was talking about, I'm linking the videos down below that I mentioned on uh, books and movies, musicals, video games, all that fun stuff. So, and I think I also link them in the cards. We'll find out, won't we? Please make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, and please remember to subscribe as well. I post new videos on Wednesdays, and of course, happy writing.